Happy Monday, everyone. My name is Cameron Cowan. This is the Cameron Cowan Show. Um, I hope you caught all the fun stuff I did on Friday. We talked about all kinds of exciting things. Um, today, we have just a few videos planned. I am, as you know, I, besides doing this show, I'm also a writer. And I have a lot of stuff going on this week. And... Oh, don't have a ton of time for, you can tell, well, the weeks when I have done as much going on, we do a ton of videos, and the weeks I have a lot going on, I just have to, to get something out there. So, this is one of those weeks where we don't have as much going on as we might otherwise. So, um, it's, so we have a, a couple, a couple of things, um, a couple of things going. Um, there was a huge, huge article on um, reparations in the Atlantic. It was by a guy named uh, Tenezi Coates. And it starts out pretty dramatically. It starts out, after 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of racist housing policy, until we reckon with our compounding moral debts, America will never be whole. And the article goes on to make a pretty a pretty fair case for reparations. Um, the prime example he he uses um, is a man named Clyde Ross, who was born in 1923. Um, this poor fellow started in the Jim Crow South in the tw in the twenties, and then he escaped to Chicago, where he got caught up in the Lawndale housing contract scheme, which are those. If you're not familiar with those things, um, after the end of the Civil War, it was quite common, especially for um, former slaves after the 40 acres and a mule promise fell through, that um, they would work for their, they basically work for the people they worked before. Um, only this time, as sharecroppers, they basically work the, they would work the land, everything would get pulled together, the plantation owner would sell it, and they would split the money. Well due to the fact that there was still a great deal of resentment um, with having to treat former slaves as equals among many of the plantation owners, um, the wages of any of the sharecroppers was basically treated as slush fund money that they didn't have to give, they could do what they want with. If they chose to pay people, they could pay them. Or if they wanted to use it for their own dalliances, then that's what they did. Um, property of former slaves, and keep in mind, this is you know, this goes from 1877 when federal troops leave until 1923 when this guy comes along. This guy ha had his horse stolen by a white, literally stolen by a white person because there was no, if it was owned by a black person, it wasn't property because they weren't people. Like, in Jim Crow South, I wasn't a person. That's right. I don't exist. I don't exist. Um, that was standard operating procedure in the Jim Crow South. Um, it's, uh, his, his losses just go on, and, and unfortunately he was, this is very, um, uh, this is very common among people. His father was, had his land seized due to back taxes that couldn't prove it, it existed, um, uh, that their, um, their, uh, the Associated Press did a story about, um, the theft of black-owned land going back to, bef to the, before the Civil War, um, over 24,000 acres of land valued at tens of millions of dollars was taken, um, part of it's become a country club in Virginia, some of it's oil fields in Mississippi, um, there's a baseball spring training facility in Florida, I mean, it just goes on and goes on and goes on. Um, this fellow, Clyde Ross, here wasn't allowed to attend a better school because there was no, um, there was no teacher for black children. There was only a bus for white children. Um, it, it just goes on, and, and so they eventually, the man in the, in the story escapes to Chicago, and he gets caught up in the Lawndale contract housing scheme. I recently read a book about a woman whose father helped defend contract, um, uh, help defend contract uh, home buyers in in Chicago, um, in especially in the 40s and 50s after World War II, 
um, you had kind of two diverging trends going on. You had the trend of home ownership, which is what really pressed making the suburbs possible. Uh, William Lovett and Lovett Towns and all this kind of thing. Um, and a very kind of growing, legitimate mortgage market. On the other end of that, um, you had African Americans who were also trying to get in on the post-war prosperity, but the legal mortgage market was not open to them. Um, this is also combined by redlining, where um, African Americans could only buy in certain neighborhoods. So, you are black, you want a house, you can only buy in black neighborhoods, and the legitimate mortgage market is not open to you. So, in order to get a house, which was a significant measure of wealth in the 20th century, um, they would buy the houses from the owners on contract. Now, here's what the owners would do. They would go and buy the house very inexpensively. Eight, eleven thousand dollars was a lot of, well, it, it wasn't a lot of money back then, it isn't a lot of money now, but back then a house didn't, you know, only cost maybe fifteen thousand um, dollars. Uh, so, you had... Um, so they would go buy the house cheap, $11,000, they would resell it on contract for $27,000, which in the 50s, you could, a, a, a white person get out a massive house for twenty seven, a very nice house in a very expensive suburb, for $27,000. For example, my nana, in 1975, for a four-bedroom house in the country, in a decent suburb, only paid $27,000, but she was a white woman. So, you have someone in southeast Chicago, in Lawndale, and North Lawndale, basically getting maybe a two-story shack in not great repair for way overpriced, but it was all you could get, so people took it. It was better than renting. People took it. The sad part about contract buying is you had all the obligations of home ownership with none of with none of the of the privileges. The payments weren't saved as equity. That wasn't that wasn't wealth you could borrow on. If you ever missed a payment, you would forfeit your deposit, which could be up to $1,000, and all your monthly payments up, up until then. Um, you were basically at the mercy of the person you were buying the house on contract from. Um, and because the primary people who were doing this in the neighborhood were black, there was no recourse at all for... Um, if something went wrong, which it did, but there was ab absolutely no recourse for it. If you if uh, if you missed a monthly payment, the owner could kick you out of the house, and they would resell these houses three, four times. One of the realtors even said that if someone was in this scheme and they were not making a hundred thousand dollars a year, which was a lot of money in the fifties and sixties, um, they were loafing and not working very hard. So, it's it was quite. It was it was quite uh, it was it was quite difficult and it was criminal, absolutely criminal. But that that was the second class nature of being black in this country was that if you were black you weren't a person. So he goes on, and he goes through this poor man. He goes through the contract housing scheme. He goes through redlining, all this kind of thing, um, and and he you know. He, he, he goes through all of this, and towards the end, he begins to build the case for basically why we need reparations. And it's, yes, African Americans have lived as, and ostensibly still do live, as second-class citizens in this country, and have done so for some time. Um... And I, when I was in college, I would sit with, we'd all be, we had these wonderful cultural houses at UNC, and one was called the Marcus Garvey Center, and it was to celebrate African American culture. And I would hang out there a lot, and I didn't have a lot of friends, and I, I had not really known people of my own color until I went to college. So I, so I, I was hanging out there, and I was, I was, I was kind of learning who I was. And we would talk about reparations, and I said, oh, reparations, and I said, I think reparations are a terrible idea. Absolutely terrible idea. They should not be done. I just don't think, I just don't think this is going to work. Um, and people would be very, very much in favor of reparations, and I think it's, I think it's difficult. I think it's difficult to say, um, you know, yes, we should have 
reparations because, you know, these people deserve money because they were enslaved, you know, all this kind of thing. And it's like, well, all the slaves who were enslaved have long been dead. It's been 150 years. <coughs> if you try to say you're a descendant of the slave trying to prove that, it's going to be almost impossible, including family Bibles, documentation, all this other thing. That's going to be very, very difficult. Um, it's, uh... It's it's just it's just messy. Not that Bill Conyers from Detroit hasn't tried every single year to make it happen. I mean, he's every single year he's been in Congress, and it's a real loss. He didn't get back on the ballot in Michigan, so it's going to be a real a real loss for him. But it's it, it's it's difficult to say you know yay reparations and let's do this when one that would it would create a great deal more racial tension than we already have. Um, it would, I don't think it would ever pass because the Republican Party is very much against handouts, and let's face it, a few Democrats are too. Um, I think reparations like that would absolutely explode this country. I think the even more difficult part is that, um, is that, uh, there are other groups ostensibly that deserve reparations as well. To my knowledge, there have been no reparations for the Japanese who were put in internment camps during World War II and had their land forcibly taken from them and never returned. Um, they are, many of them are still alive. <laughs> um, and they, and their children are definitely alive. Um, and they, they deserve, they deserve reparations as much as I and my family might for slavery. It's, I think there are different programs you could do to begin to create wealth in the black community. Um, and I'm going to post this on the blog. I had a dis I had a back and forth with my mother about this article. Um, and I, I outlined some ideas, and so I'm going to post them with this video on the blog. It's going to be quite the little setup. Um, and uh, and I'm going to have kind of all all stepped out. And in what I think we you know in terms of forgiving student loan debt, that could be quite helpful. Um, matching savings programs and investment programs, financial education. There are things you could do to build quantifiable wealth in the black community that I think could be could be quite good. Um, it's I in my opinion, I do not know that there is enough money or enough anything that could fix 150 years of what has gone on or replace 150 years of, of lost wealth, lost job opportunity, lost anything. You have an entire class of people in this country who have been scraping by for generations. And at this point, you have structural, generational poverty, and that's not something you can heal overnight. The article is really good. And it goes through a lot, and it really sets up the case for reparations, including um, precedents for reparations um, during colonial times in the 18th century. Um, it really does a good job of explaining kind of how how we got here. Um, the the Lawndale Contract Buyers League, who actually spent 10 years in court trying to stop it and lost. Um, it talks about poverty in this country. Um, goes through the affirmative action debate. There are quite a lot of people who are against affirmative action. And I think the most frustrating thing about race in this country and reparations, and I talked about this in a previous video, was the attitude that Obama's in office, we must be a post-racial society like that proves that you can do anything, sit down and shut up, without realizing that's, that's not even the beginning of the problem. You know, it's... It's, you know, a any advantage that, you know, so someone wrote, any advantage that Obama's daughters have, have, that any advantage that Obama's daughters have is not going to be nearly as great as the advantage Jenna and Barbara Bush might have had because their family has been rich for four generations. And the, it's, it's the business, it's the connections, it's, I mean, it's, it's the whole package. It's everything. It all matters. And you're not, you can't change that overnight. You can't, you can't, I mean, unless you, I mean, you can't, you can't even pass enough laws. You can't transfer enough wealth. You can't tax enough people 
to solve those problems. And I, I get very frustrated by those who say, oh, it's a post-racial society, like, we should be able to hire whoever we want to. You know, if we don't talk about it, it won't be a problem, and that really only ignores the problem. And I'm not really the type, the type of person to come along and be hawkish on race. Um, far from it. Um, I'm, I'm one of those, that I think education is important, I think the black community has some deep um, cultural issues around education and money and all this kind of thing, but I think that comes from a bad combination of slave and ghetto mentality. And when you have those two things conspiring together, and you look at an outside world that's not exactly what one might call friendly to you, it can be easy to fall into that. And so, I, the problem, as like as many problems are, is incredibly, incredibly nuanced. But I do agree with him. We should, um, uh, we should begin to, um, we should begin to look at how, how can we, um, how do we create programs and processes and things in place that really and dramatically changes African-American poverty. I think that's the only kind of reparations that we can really, really get moving, I think. And I, I think we need to look at at how, how do we do that? What does that look like? How can we create that? What is the proof going to be? And make it as open and hopefully as least fraudulent as possible. I think that's the best thing we can do. I will be doing, all, like I said, on this, I had, I had discussed several different ideas with my mother in an email exchange we have, because her and I like to do that. Um, so I'm going to post um, snippets of that email exchange on the blog. Um, that video will be there as well, and the article to the entire Atlantic article, which online is very long, and um, I actually read it in print again, and it was eight pages. So um, I, if you want to go read it in paper, I encourage you to go grab it in the June Atlantic issue, um, which is on stands now, and uh, and it's the link will be beneath this video as well. So this video has run long. Thank you for watching. Um, this is the Cameron Cowan Show. Catch me on social media, and uh, don't forget to keep the discussion going. I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Hi, my name is Cameron. I'm the host of the Cameron Cowan Show, as you know. Um, or at least you should know if you saw the channel and found this video. It's pretty obvious. The title cards um, would have told you that. Um, so last week, um, America's Treasure, one of the best poets of our time, Maya Angelou, died um, at the ripe age of 86. Um, on Friday's video, I mentioned it. Um, and I didn't um, have time to put together a full and complete um, Maya Angelou tribute, um, so I wanted to do one for Monday. I spent all weekend um, working on it and preparing for it, so I am excited uh, to be uh, to be to be doing this. Um, she was actually one of the few people I really did want to meet before she died, and unfortunately that didn't didn't get to happen. But. Um, it would have been really wonderful. I've I've been I've been close. I actually knew people who knew her. I was not that many degrees away. I was one degree away, and it didn't it didn't quite happen. Um, but she was a huge inspiration for me to become a writer. She was a huge inspiration, I think, to every African American child. I mean, I think everybody who's black in this country has looked to her as. Um, you know, just a really, a really big inspiration, and kind of a, a, a vanguard, a city on a hill, a torch in the darkness, someone who, you know, when, <laughs> it's like when you're feeling down, you're feeling like you just can't take it anymore, you know, read Maya Angelou and you will feel better. Um, most people don't know, she was a, she also was a singer, um, she was a dancer as well, um, she did a lot of dance back in the 50s and 60s, um, before she became a writer and a poet. She was the first black female um, poet laureate, and she recited poems at two presidential inaugurations. Um, she was a absolutely remarkable woman and an amazingly musical, very distinctive voice. 
very distinctive voice. And so I wanted to read a couple of, um, of my favorite poems of hers as a tribute. Um, this first one's called, uh, Sepia Fashion Show. Their hair, pomaded, faces jaded, bones protruding hip-wise. The model strutted, backed and butted, then stuck out their mouths lip-wise. They'd nasty manners, held like banners, while they looked down their nose-wise. I'd tell em in hell before they'd sell me one thing they're wearing clothes-wise. The black bourgeoisie, who all say ya yeah, when ya yeah is what they're meaning, should look around both up and down before they set out preening. Indeed, they swear, that's what I'll wear when I go country clubbing. I'd remind them, please, at those knees, you got a Miss Anne scrubbing. This next one's called My Arkansas, which I enjoy, um, growing up in Arkansas, as she did as well. Um, it reminds a little bit of being, being down there. There is a deep brooding in Arkansas. Old crimes like moss penned from poplar trees. The sullen earth is too much red for comfort. Sunrise seems to hesitate, and in that second lose its incandescent aim, and dusk no more shadows than the noon. The past is brighter yet. Old hates and antebellum lace are rent but not discarded. Today is yet to come in Arkansas. It rides, it rides in awful waves of brooding. To beat the child was bad enough. A young body light as winter sunshine, a new seed's bursting promise hung from a string of silence above its future. The chance of choice was never known. Hunger, new hands, strange voices, its cry came natural tearing. Water boiled in innocence, gaily in a cheap pot. The child exchanged its curiosity for terror. The skin withdrew, the flesh submitted. Now cries make shards of broken air, beyond an unremembered, hunger and the peace of strange hands. A young body floats, silently. Still I rise. <clears throat> You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room? Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, Still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes? Shoulders falling like teardrops, Weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it an a awful hard, Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines Digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words, You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the hut, huts of history, shame, I rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, Welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. 
Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. And this last one is my personal favorite. It's called Caged Bird. And when I was growing up, um, I felt like I was a bird in a cage. And when I first read this poem and I first heard about it from someone, I thought it was written for me. And so I want to finish with this one because this is a poem I will carry with me the rest of my life. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped, his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. A free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting in a dawn-bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams, his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream, his wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill, of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Thanks for listening to this tribute. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do, and I hope uh, my Angelou rests in peace. We'll all be remembering her and remembering her work. I encourage you to read it if you haven't. Um, there's lots of great videos on YouTube, and go pick up a book somewhere. There's plenty. Thanks, I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.